Why, hello there. Thanks for stopping by. I hear you'd like to know more about Gravesend. Well, you come to the right place. Gravesend, Massachusetts was originally settled in 1750 as a small Quaker community and was bought from the Hatchetawney Indians in the gun purchase of 1756. Quinn Stockbridge Gun made the purchase for 14 pounds of hardtack and munitions for every man, woman, and child in the Hatchetawney tribe, at the time numbering only 125. The town was originally named Quinston, after Quinn, who was known for his work preaching Christianity to natives and for the grist mills he erected all along the Little River. Tragedy struck in 1759. The Hatchetawney tribe's numbers nearly halved as a result of their lack of training with their new firearms. They attacked the fledgling settlement, blaming the whites for their misfortune. The resulting battle allowed the town to annex nearly 15,000 acres of land that same year. It's said that Chief Grey Wolf cursed the land with his dying breath. With heavy losses on the town and more grist than they knew what to do with, the mayor passed the Green Grant Bill, which guaranteed five acres of land and 40 pounds of grist to any family that settled in the town that year. The population swelled. Around New Year's Day, 1776, General Henry Knox passed into Massachusetts through the town, bringing cannons eastward from Fort Ticonderoga to help end the siege of Boston. Unfortunately, there was an accident at the town's inn, and some of the powder caught fire, destroying the inn and killing 18 townsfolk and 12 soldiers. A new inn was erected on the spot later the next year, and a small plaque was placed on the cornerstone of the old building to commemorate the dead. The route General Knox's men took is known as the Knox Trail, and a marker is located at the state line. In the winter of 1778, there was a grain famine, because much of the stored grist had become infected with the fungus, rendering it inedible. There are rumors that during this time period, the citizens of Quinston went deep into the woods, performed satanic rituals, and resorted to cannibalism in order to survive the winter. The rumors of strange cannibalistic families living deep in the woods persist still to this day, but they're probably just tall tales. In 1780, Quinston was struck by a brief malaria outbreak that cut the population by nearly one-third, resulting in the second Green Grant Bill. An outbreak that severe had never been recorded as far north as Massachusetts before or since. In 1782, the town was incorporated under a new name, Gravesend. And that's just the beginning. Modern Gravesend has a lot to offer the sightseer and history buff alike. Gravesand is home to the largest ball of twine east of the Mississippi. Our story begins in 1953, when farmer Frank Stover, an efficient and tidy man, began to roll spare bits of sizzle twine into a small ball in his barn. But over the years, instead of reusing or disposing of the twine, Frank kept rolling. By 1957, his twine ball weighed 2.5 tons and stood 8 feet tall. By 1961, when he turned it over to the town, Stober had over 1,600,000 feet of twine rolled into a sphere 11 feet in diameter. Unfortunately, one day while showing the ball off to some locals, it rolled over on top of Stober, killing him. To this day, the ball of twine sits there as a monument to Stober and his single-mindedness. Perhaps the most interesting part about Gravesend is the Elmwood Rehabilitation Center. Originally built in 1915 as an orphanage, it was restored and expanded in 1979 with the funds given to the town by a massive government grant. Patients suffering from mental and emotional disorders were shipped from around the country to the new facility for treatment. Just last year, the Elmwood Rehabilitation Center was totally revamped with all-new, state-of-the-art technology, automating most of the security and day-to-day -day operations of the facility, allowing them to cut down on staff by almost 70%. By using uh, cutting-edge technology, we were actually able to automate many of the jobs here uh, at, at Elmwood, effectively cutting down the staff by more than half. From our command center, we can do any number of things, such as uh, opening and closing the doors, uh, locking them, um, turning on and off the lights. Um, it's really it's, it's quite remarkable uh, what we were able to do with just the touch of a few dials. Um, 
And by saving all the money on labor costs, we're actually able to focus on what matters more, which is the treatment of the patients. Whoa, Wesley, that is tubular to the max. And while you're around, you should check out the Gravesend Public House. Gravesend Public House Historic Inn is a great place to spend a few days taking in the sights and smells of Gravesend. After burning down in the Great Knox Fire of 1776, it was rebuilt in 1777 to accommodate twice the guests. In 1786, a tornado blew through town, destroying the new inn, but another was built in its stead. After being closed down in the early 1900s due to the owner's mysterious disappearance, it was restored and reopened in 1943. The public house has had an array of famous guests over the years, including Alexander Hamilton's cousin-in-law and Sean Hughes, a very popular Elvis impersonator from the 70s. The inn is rumored to be haunted by the spirit of an original Hachatani Indian brave, though it's hard to tell. According to eyewitness reports, the apparition is apparently missing its head. But that doesn't stop it from screaming at you as you lay terrified in bed, though. Thanks for stopping by my hometown. From the culture, to the people, to the Grisknos, Gravesend sure does have a lot to offer the curious tourist. I hope you come back so we can see each other again real soon. Bye-bye now.